fantastic turnout and fantastic crew of people. I'm guessing you're all pretty darn knowledgeable about the Worcester range. So um, some of what I'm sharing with you may not surprise you very much at all. Um, we do presentations, um, we've done presentations three winters now on a whole range of topics related to forests and public land management um, here. Um, and I'm not gonna spend a lot of time on the science tonight of uh, forest management, some, but I invite you, we have a YouTube channel, um, Standing Trees and also Save Public Forests, which is the coalition that we've created. Um, YouTube channels that have some fantastic presentations by reg regional and global experts on forest management, on forest carbon. And so if we don't get to everything that you're interested in tonight, check those out. And there's some uh, great resources there. But also during Q&A, if, if, I, if I don't get to something that you, you know, have a burning question about, please um, ask and, and maybe we can dig into that here tonight too. Um, so let's, let's dig in. Um, so Standing Trees is, uh, is the new kid on the block in uh, the you know, New England environmental community. And for those, some of you, many of you maybe even are familiar with the organization, but for those of you who are not, um, we've been around as, a, as an idea for about three years now. We've had a budget for two years um, and a staff person about that same amount of time. And I feel very, very fortunate to be um, working for Standing Trees um, I helped to found it with a collection of people just like you who are passionate about public land protection. And we got started because um, we were looking around for help from Vermont's existing environmental nonprofit community, and we were not finding it. We were not finding that help. And I was working for that nonprofit community, and I could not find the help. Before coming to Standing Trees, I was at Conservation Law Foundation. Um, and before that at Northeast Wilderness Trust. Um, and prior to that, working for Montana Wilderness Association for uh, the better part of 10 years. And while out in Montana, I got a really good glimpse of how a high-functioning public land advocacy community works. You can shake a stick in any direction in that part of the country and you will find a group that is active, passionate, organized, either at the landscape scale or at the you know, state level. Uh, regional level, working to protect public lands. And I grew up here in New England, and I always thought that there was an organization or maybe several organizations doing that kind of public land work here. I took that for granted. I just assumed that was the way it was. I left New England when I was 18, uh, 21 years ago, uh, to go work in the Cascades for the Forest Service. And, uh, you know, kind of came of age in that, in that landscape, working for a uh, you know, variety of nonprofits out that way, um, doing public land work. And when I came back to New England five years ago with my family, I was stunned that New England didn't have those resources, that infrastructure. If you just look across Lake Champlain at the Adirondacks, it's a whole different story with the um, degree of, of knowledge of public lands and their importance and the uh, existing organizations, you know, really uh, incredible diversity of organizations working on public land issues. So we're trying to create something new here in New England, which seems like we shouldn't have had to do, but, but we're doing it. And uh, it's been an amazing ride so far. And I invite you to be a part of it. You're a part of it being here tonight. Um, so this is, this is a, a quote from a great book uh, by Mary Bird Davis. Um, the book is uh, Eastern Old Growth Forest Prospects for Recovery and Rediscovery. Wonderful book. I think it is out of print, but you can find a copy without too much trouble. And I, I would say this is our guiding quote as an organization. We're between two forested worlds, the natural forest of pre-European settlement North America and the recovered forest of the future. The earlier forested world is not dead. We are studying and struggling to preserve its living remnants and we do not believe the future forest is powerless to be born. These remnants, with our help, will become the seeds from which a renewed forest spreads. That is what we do at Standing Trees, focusing on, on public land protection. And maybe some of you recognize this view. Any, any guesses where this is from? It's an unusual vantage point, but it's in, the, in your neighborhood, in our neighborhood. 
<laughs> this is the view from Eagle Ledge, um, looking looking down the uh, the north kind of down the North Branch Valley. Um, and now this is inside of the Northeast Wilderness Trust Woodbury Mountain Preserve. Um, so you know, this is our this is our valley. This you know the North Branch, and um, and this is our mountain range, the Worcester Range. Uh, and and you know, I I feel like it's the center of gravity for me, living here in Montpelier. I go on walks up North Street all the time, um, and you know, I think for many people who live here in town, um, you know, it, it is just kind of where you go to to free your mind and and and. Uh, and the Worcester Range is always, always out there for me as kind of an anchor um, for me. And so this is, it's deeply personal. Um, and I, I know it means only more to many of you in the room who have grown up with the Worcester Range or lived in its shadow for far, far, far longer than I have. Um, and, you know, at Standing Trees, I, I wanted to also begin by saying, you know, we are approaching this work uh, looking far into the future and far behind. And I wanted to read our land acknowledgement, if you'd let me for a second, uh, because working with Vermont's Abenaki community has been really important to, uh, again, who we are as an organization from the get-go. Um, so this will take a second, but. Standing Trees wishes to begin this gathering, acknowledging and affirming the ancestral and ongoing presence of the Abenaki and Mohican peoples in the land we now commonly refer to as Vermont. The word indigenous literally means originating or occurring naturally in a particular place. The rich cultures of the Abenaki and Mohican peoples are of this place. They grew and they continue to grow from this ground. Over millennia, their cultures were and continue to be shaped by the particularities of the soil, the rocks, trees, air, water, creatures large and small, that share this Green Mountain home. Equally important, these indigenous cultures shaped, storied, and animated this landscape. This reciprocal relationship goes back countless generations, but because of injustices perpetrated over the last 400 years to the present day, the relationship is strained, tattered, and hanging on by threads, but it's not broken. What does it mean for indigenous cultures and their home landscapes when the two are disconnected from one another? How can these cultures in the land and water from which they arose overcome centuries of violence? What does it mean when we erase a deeply storied landscape where teachings on conduct, morality, ethics, and respect were literally woven into the geography? Right? Uh, the, I was just talking to some indigenous uh, partners today at the Winter Center for Indigenous Traditions, and you know, uh, just beginning to kind of learn some of the names for landscape features around here that I, I should really know, and I wish we all knew, um, and could you know kind of do a do us all, which would do us all a service to, to you know reanimate, restory this landscape. In braiding sweetgrass, Robin Wall Kimmerer writes: Just as old growth forests are richly complex, so too were the old growth cultures that arose at their feet. How much richer would our modern day culture become if we had the wisdom and humility to allow our forest to grow old once more? How much richer would we become if we didn't just restore this landscape, but we restoried this landscape? So um, I think that's what we're all doing here. And in our advocacy, we are restoring these places. We're adding meaning to places where I, I think literally the meaning was stripped in the post-colonial era. And um, so that's our, that's our job here, is, is bringing that significance, that meaning, back to this place. So at Standing Trees, our work falls into you know, three big buckets. Um, education and organizing, that's kind of what we're doing here tonight. Um, we do a lot of policy advocacy. We were uh, deeply involved in the drafting and the passage of Act 59, the Community Resilience and Biodiversity Protection Act. Um, we were also very closely involved in adding that new reserve forest land category and use value appraisal a couple of years ago. Um, and then when necessary, we use the law. Um, and we were uh, in court with the state of Vermont just this last year over the Camel's Hump Management Plan, but actually really management of all state lands. 
And we'll get into why we were in court with the state, because that issue has not gone away. And it's um, at the root of the problem with the Worcester Range uh, management plan, too. Welcome, welcome. Come on in. Thank you. So um, I think most of you know the cri environmental crises that we're living through. Again, I'm not going to spend a lot of time on, on the science here, but some. Um, I would say extinction, our water quality crisis, and the climate crisis are, of course, are all intertwined and are three of the kind of major issues that we're dealing with right now. I think it's like traumatic, unnecessarily traumatic to put pictures like that up um, on the screen. Human extinction. <laughs> that, that too, and for critters like the pine marten. Um, but where all of these come together, where I should say solutions come together for water quality, for the climate, for uh, biodiversity, is in this, this central space of natural solutions. And um, I just put up a smattering of things here that, you know, Vermont has this amazing document, this blueprint for biodiversity uh, protection and restoration, Vermont conservation design. We passed this law last year that tries to put Vermont conservation design into action on the ground, uh, Act 59. We have the Vermont Climate Action Plan, which takes a good look at uh, all of these things and actually was what spurred Act 59 uh, was, was, you know, the recommendations in the, in the cap. Um, we have our Lake Champlain Restoration Plan and we have our State Hazard Mitigation Plan, which grew out of Hurricane Irene um, and, you know, we're still figuring out how to, how to uh, uh, put into action on the ground. But I all, would like to hear yeah. how the state's plan for the Worcester Range agrees or doesn't meet the criteria in these five documents. I would like to thank you for your nice introduction tonight, but I think we have less than two weeks before the deadline That's to right. comment. I think that we're not here to pick the plan apart because if we look at tiny parts, we're going to miss the whole yeah. document. We need to stop this. We don't need to say, your science or your plan is wrong here. We need to stop it. And I want to hear from you how we're going to do that. Bravo, excellent questions, and I promise you that's exactly where I'm going, <laughs> is how we're going to stop this. We have a little more than that, and, and I, um, I, 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 what I'm doing here is I'm trying to share with you some of the things that have kind of made it into the plan and those things that have been completely left out of the plan. I um, so it, we're, I'll, we'll, I'll show you kind of, all, I'll get you some good answers to those questions in, in just a second. Um, what I want to uh, just, I, I had an op-ed out in, in Digger earlier this, or last year, right after the flood in July, um, and the focus of it was, let's stop blaming climate change for all of the problems that we are up against right now. Because the land, the land management decisions that we're making each and every day, that we've been making for the last four centuries in New England, have all shaped how our communities either are you know adapted to or not <laughs> adapted to uh, the climate? Let's look at Montpelier, right? Montpelier is in the worst possible location um, for climate change adaptation and, and resilience. Um, we're going to flood again and again in in this setting that we live in here. Um, and so when we look at you know a Wor the Worcester Range Management Plan, um, you know. What could we, let, let's think critically about what we could be doing differently to make sure that our downstream communities um, fare differently than, than they did in this last flooding event. So I'll breeze through these things. You will all know what the Worcester Range looked like. These are photos from the White Mountains, um, but you know it was a very similar story here in the Greens. Um, we were down to you know very little forest cover uh, in, in Vermont at the end of the 1800s and the early 1900s. That's the legacy we're living with today. So in 150 years, since kind of peak uh, deforestation in New England, we have trees back in you know, 80% of the Vermont landscape, more or less. 
but I would not argue that we have forests back in our landscape. And I think this is a critical distinction that most people just aren't thinking about. Um, most you know, of our forest in New England is, is younger than 150 years of age. Um, does that qualify as a forest yet? You know, I think the more you learn about an, an old growth forest, the more skeptically you would look at the trees and, and, and the forest that we have today and think of them as healthy functioning landscapes. Um, so trees might be renewable, but forests are not. And, you know, we all use wood products, uh, not arguing against that in the slightest, but um, we've got to be thinking about how we're creating forests. Um, and, and that takes time. That's the chief component of making forests, time and space. So this is a, this next slide. Oh, no, here we go. So when I say old growth forest, what makes an old growth forest different or, or unique? You know, when you're in a mature forest or a rapidly maturing forest like we have um, in the Worcester range, you might see some of these things. You might see a canopy gap of a quarter acre in size or less, which is the typical size of an opening in, in, in our forest here in northern New England, where a few trees have blown over, creating these micro habitats that are essential for, you know, all of the biodiversity that, um, you know, thrive in our, in our forests here. Um, you've got, you know, standing dead trees, uh, decaying logs on the ground. Um, you know, this is, a, this, is a healthy, this is a healthy forest ecosystem. And what was so interesting, maybe some of you saw this at the public meetings that I'm sure many of you went to, but they had a map up at one of those stations saying uh, forest damage. And it was a map showing insects, wind damage, all these things. And I went up to the person and I said, is that really damage? Or are these kind of natural processes that are critical to shaping a healthy forest? And the forester kind of paused and looked at me and didn't really know how to answer that question. And we had a good chat about, you know, um, why the state was presenting all of the ice storm, you know, uh, you know, disturbance or wind disturbance as damage. Um, and, you know, maybe someday they'll take a kind of more holistic look at how they present that information. Um, so, I know this is a little bit hard to see, but I wanted to just give a sense of, of, of the you know, public land situation in Vermont. Um, about 20% of Vermont is, is public land, uh, roughly split equally between uh, federal and, and state lands. There's a little bit of municipal land mixed in as well. Um, and if we zero in on just this, Oh, and here I wanted to share a little bit more from a report that just came out this year called uh, Wildlands in New England um, by David Foster. And uh, we contributed to this report as well. Uh, it's a continuation of the Wildlands and Woodlands program. So about 25% of the New England landscape is protected from development, but only 3% of Vermont and New England is in wildland management, meaning off limits to timber harvest. So the Wildlands and Woodlands vision has been 10% in wildlands, and that goes back to 2006 when that uh, report first came out. And we've made almost no progress, really, towards that 10% goal in that time. A little bit, a little bit here and there, like with places like the Woodbury Mountain Preserve. But there is so much more to be done. Um, and let's start in the Worcester Range. <laughs> the Worcester Range is the largest wildland, functional wildland, north of I-89 in the state of Vermont. That doesn't include 15... the right side of Route 12, does it? That green thing, because on the right side of Route 12, it's very un undisturbed also. Yes, this is just showing public land on, in the highlighted areas. But the, there's a 15,600 acre block of contiguous uh, land in, in, in the C.C. Putnam State Forest primarily that is the single largest wildland, small w, wildland, meaning it's not protected as such, but it functions as a wildland. Largest anywhere, the closest that there is to it is the, uh, excuse me, the uh, West Mountain Wildlife Management Area uh, core area, which is a 12,000 acre um, reserve that the state of Vermont manages. So this is the single largest, I mean, I would say this is the, you know, gem of central slash northern Vermont. And, and the Worcester Range is, as many of you know, at this critical uh, location for wildlife moving, you know, east, west, and north, south, um, it's really this pivot point. It's kind of, you know, 
just essential for. And if we had those other private land protected areas shown here on the map, like Woodbury Mountain, you would see how there's starting to be a stair step of wildlands moving across into the Northeast Kingdom and beyond. But the Worcester Range should be that, that next pivotal piece that's permanently protected. Okay, I think I just said as much. I forgot I had this map in here too. So here's the Woodbury Mountain Preserve. This is showing the natural area. That's just the natural area boundary. Um, and it's almost just the tiny spruce trees, right? It's, yeah, just 4,000 acres, mostly around like when the 2,500. The yep. Stunted. That's What's right. What's the elevation? It's 25. of that boundary. It's about 2,500 feet and up in, in the Worcesters. Um, and something to note, we argued very hard when this wildlands report was being made this last year, we requested that all of these state lands be kept out of the report. And the reason for that is that there is almost no protection for these lands. These are what are called highly sensitive management areas. And the state of Vermont designates these every time it does a management plan. But the state can do management plans kind of however, however it wants to, whenever it wants to. There's no formal process. There are no rules in place for developing those management plans. And they only last 20 years. The idea of wildlands is that it's permanent. And, this, and the wildlands report defines wildlands as an intent to permanently protect these lands. So the good thing about this is that the state of Vermont has committed to wildlands management of these state land parcels. Um, but the bad thing is that they're not really that well protected. And the state needs something equivalent to, for example, you know, Adirondack, uh, you know, constitutional protection, or we need something more like there are various, there's about a dozen states with state wilderness acts, like a federal wilderness act in miniature. These are all options potentially to codify protection for these areas. Yeah, go ahead. Act 250 defines that 2,500 foot pile. Right. For building. Yeah. Yeah, but so that, that protection has been in play for 50 years. Yeah, right. I, one of the points I make is that most of that area is uh, by default. It's shallow soils, it's wet soils, right. it's the ridge lines. Yep. It's, there's no protection in the lower elevation. Right. So, and I'll get more into that in just a second. Yeah, is, go is ahead. Is that blue what's called in the plan the natural area? Yes. Okay, so that's the same. And that's not expanding. The natural area is not proposed for expansion. They could have done that too in this in, in this uh, yeah. plan, kind of but the the highly sensitive management area designation would expand the functional natural area by another four thousand acres or so, four to five thousand acres in the in the proposed plan. That's good, except for the fact that the whole 15,600 15, acre contiguous block is a wildland right now. And half of it is being proposed for and timber the plan management. Said they do nothing in the natural area, right? They do That's right. They 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 won't do anything. But which does mean though they're fully protected, even if they're small. They're fully protected, except that. Do you all remember when Stowe and Smugs were in conversation about that lift, which is still not really dead, but it's it on, on on. I just saw that because I was searching. Yeah. Uh, a A and R in the news, and they said the gondola is gone. It's, it's, it's gone only while they do their next economic study that they want to present to the state to bring it back. So I don't think it's actually the dead. Yeah, the resort. Um, but the, the, the reason I mention it is that to the district stewardship team's credit, the same team that is doing the Worcester Range plan, Brad Greeno, who uh, is the, the lead of the team, wrote a very powerful and compelling statement about why they were not going to allow that ski lift to be built. Because the current Mount Mansfield management plan says you cannot do that here. So the advantage of having a plan, there was, a, I think you might have asked the question at the meeting in Worcester about why do we need this plan? It's a great question. Why do we need this plan? The Worcester Range is doing great right now. I think it's doing better than almost any public land in New England. In a lot of ways, I think it's better off without change, any changes that would come from this plan. But the time that a plan works well is when it sets us up for a good decision, like the one that Brad was able to make in that case where um, Stowe and Smugs wanted to build that lift. Without that plan in place, I think that lift would have gotten the green light right away. Um, so, you know, good planning 
That's, that, that's a good thing. Bad planning is, is another story. Um, but the natural area designation is really flimsy. It's the best we have in Vermont. It still can be changed by the governor, um, just really by the flick of the wrist. You can draw away the boundaries of a natural area. It doesn't take any act of the legislature here to change a natural area boundary. They have to hold one hearing, and then they can get rid of the natural area um, or adjust the boundaries. Does that happen much? It hasn't, it's never happened as far as I know, but there's no reason it, it, it couldn't happen. Um, but it's also places that they can hardly that's true, except for building things like ski lifts. Um, so, okay, there's going to be some text in the next few slides, but I wanted to point a few kind of key things out about state land management in Vermont. Um, Vermont state lands are managed in a multiple use framework. You've maybe heard about this, you know, in relation to the way the U.S. Forest Service or the you know Bureau of Land Management manages our public lands. Um, there is no timber harvest mandate. So something that somebody said to me after the uh, Worcester public meeting was that the state staff were saying, we have to cut trees. Like it's what's something that we have to do, you know? Um, the state can, but it is not a shall. There is no, sh you shall cut trees on state lands. And there's nothing saying that the state has to cut trees in any particular location. The Worcester range could be uh, decided right now by Commissioner, you know, Fitzko, uh, by Commissioner Herrick of Fish and Wildlife, that we're going to manage the Worcester Range differently from other management units as a whole unit. Multiple use can mean any number of different kinds of uses, right? Timber is just one of those um, uses. So I think it's really important to dispel that myth that we have to be sourcing wood products from, you know, all state lands. The multiple use idea has created this kind of lowest common denominator forest management where, you know, state and federal agencies argue that we have to do everything everywhere. Well, really what multiple use I think should be about is doing the best thing in the right, in the, in the best place, right? Um, and I'd argue that, you know, we shouldn't be doing cutting at all on public lands and, and we can talk more about that, but um, I don't think there's any reason that we need to be doing any logging in the Worcester Range uh, on the public lands. So, um, why does the Worcester Range need a plan? And I had your great question in mind when I wrote this. Why does it need a plan? The commissioner shall manage and plan for the use of publicly owned forests and parklands. That is something that FPR must do. They have to plan. And what's crazy is that they have never made a management plan for the Worcester Range. They are management plans for even the most tiny, obscure blocks of state land in Vermont. But somehow this 19,000 acre management unit has never gotten a management plan decades after these lands were acquired by the state. Decades. Um, decades. So... It has not been decades since the state acquired that land. Oh, it's been since the, uh, at least the, the 90s, 80s, since a lot of that upper My land was... understanding of where they're going to be accessing that land was acquired within five years. Well, that, That's yeah, the Hunger Mountain Headwaters that's Project. That's project. Yeah. Right. That's right. Yeah. Go ahead. Yeah. That's why the plan came about, because when they got the Patterson Brook track, and uh, Brownsville, pa especially Patterson Brook, which is Worcester, Middlesex, all of a sudden they have this beautiful access road. Right. right. And I think we have these access roads, and I, you know, 13 timber harvests are going to be in the Worcester area going off of West Hill Road, the access there. So all so of a sudden there's other like, accesses besides that one that they just developed over Patterson Brook. Well, there's. They redid the road going into the Hunger Trail right. this fall, but there's also a road from the last harvesting that was done with this private land. But I really yeah. think that that acquisition and all of a sudden right. being, having access said, well, we should have a plan. So you're right that there was that big, almost 2,000 acre, acre acquisition in the last, it was 2000, I think it was 2020 when that was, when that was completed. But what you're saying is that they're planning on accessing timber that was on the existing C.C. Putnam State Forest I believe it'll be both, yeah. Newly acquired and much older, right. you know, acquisitions. So they could be justified maybe for not having a plan for the chunk that has recently gone into acquisition, but... Oh, sure, yes. The lands that just came on board, it would usually take some time, obviously, for those to have a, a, you know, a zoning process done and all that. But right, it doesn't make any sense why these other lands haven't had that planning done before. Um, although I think it has worked in our favor up until now. Um, so... Uh, Here's the thing, though. 
the secretary, excuse me, the commissioner is also supposed to, shall, adopt and publish rules for state land management. And this was the essence of the litigation that we filed against the state of Vermont um, last year, because those rules have never been promulgated. So right now, the only rules that there are in place for forestry in Vermont are the acceptable management practices, which are, you know, uh, kind of bare, bare minimum guardrails for, you know, water quality. And then uh, fees that are charged for uses of campgrounds and timber that's removed from land. There are no rules for developing management plans. There's no rules for deciding where you're going to harvest timber. There's no rules for, so what does that mean? What is a rule compared to the policies that FPR has right now or the draft documents they have right now? Rules are binding. So if FPR violates a rule, they're breaking the law and you can hold them accountable for that. Um, there's a reason why these rules haven't been adopted, right? It's a lot easier, it's a lot more flexible without rules. Um, but that is really, I think, uh, a disservice to the public. These are public lands and the public deserves transparency and accountability in decision making. And so um, to the Forest Service's credit, U.S. Forest Service, there are very strict rules for, you know, developing management plans. They don't always do what, you know, standing trees would like them to do, but they're following a process that's, that's at least set out for them. The state of Vermont has no such process. It's a choose your own adventure every single time a management plan is written, for, you know, and, and it, it changes. Um, so that's where, you know, our argument is that with the Worcester Range plan, the core issue here is that there aren't rules. And that should happen before, um, you know, this, this plan moves forward. Can I ask who's the commissioner who you're referring to? Yes, um, Commissioner Danielle Fitzko is the current commissioner for Forest Parks and Recreation. And um, she is under, you know, the FPR is under uh, the Agency of Natural Resources and Secretary Julie Moore um, is her, her direct So the other supervisor. people who present a variety like foresters, the commissioner and then foresters. Who presented, you said, at the public yeah. meeting? Uh, yeah. 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 Is the commissioner elected and what's their term? The commissioner is appointed by the governor. Okay. Um, so it's, it's not something that we get to have a say in. Um, but and that and that is usually delegated. It's not the governor typically who's making these appointments. It's the secretary of the agency of natural resources who would make that appointment, or the or deputy secretary or, or whatnot. Yeah. Um, so the state. This is the, the interesting thing, though. The plot thickens. The state is planning to issue a draft rule this winter, and this is a result of the petition and the litigation that we've been involved in over the last two years. So you know that could be good news that we're going to get um, a chance to weigh in on these kind of binding. Uh, you know, uh, rules, but that should again really be done before we got this far in the in the Worcester Range planning process. Okay, I'm going to zoom through this part because you all know how unique the Worcester Range is, but I, I want to put up here, the state knows how unique it is too, and this is what makes it so galling to me that the proposal is what it is for the Worcester Range, because the Worcester Range is unique in central Vermont because it remains almost completely wild and undeveloped says the Department of Fish and Wildlife. This is a document, the, an enduring place, a really beautiful pamphlet that Fish and Wildlife co-published several years ago. You can find it online if you just search for an enduring place, Worcester Range, it'll pop right up. Um, and, uh, you know, the only place left in central Vermont that's large in scale and completely unfragmented. So again, the state knows how valuable this place is. Um, just to read a few more quotes from the draft plan, you've probably all seen this. It's of exceptional ecological importance. The dominant forest cover is relatively old and large trees of 90 to 120 years. Given the expansiveness of the major forest types comprising the Worcester Range Management Unit, the property supports the range of bird and mammal species that depend and even thrive on the interior forest that can't easily be found elsewhere in the state. So, Despite that, um, this is the plan that they're proposing. And I, I think, again, a lot of you have probably seen this already, but I, I want to make sure for, for maybe people who haven't dug into it that you get a sense of what's being proposed. So um, there are four uh, management categories that are the big, the big buckets that the land has been put into. And really, a management plan like this is a zoning document. Think about it that way. It's, it's permissive. 
It doesn't, a management plan like this does not prescribe any specific action typically in a, in a given location, except I shouldn't say that because this, that's more the case with the Forest Service. This plan does prescribe or pretty close to prescribing tim actual timber harvest, and we'll get to that in a second. Um, but what it does is it kind of opens up areas to various types of uses, mostly. That's what's going on here. So the highly sensitive management that we talked about is the, the blue. But the, that's not the natural area. It includes the natural area. But and it, and it also expands out from the natural it area. It expands out from, but I thought I saw it called general management. I thought I saw it called red. The, I thought the, I saw the natural area and then everything else would be red. No, it's, 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 so what they're, what they're essentially doing is, you know, the, the natural area, like I said, is about 4,000 like 4, acres. Oak trees and apple trees that they were doing in Crown to Point or something. Maybe, let's come back to that. Let me, let me just sh share a few more of these things here. So um, the general management, what I want you to focus on here is that they're in the light, the, the special management and the uh, general management categories make up um, what is essentially open to potential timber harvest in, in the plan. And even though this plan only, uh, I shouldn't say only, but it, it's proposing 1,900 acres of timber harvest, it's all of these lands that will be open to future timber harvest, in theory, in the next version of the plan, right? So this is a 20-year plan. There will be another 20-year plan. And those lands will be in rotation. That's how, that's how this works. And so that's about 50-50. The blue is about 50% of the whole thing. That's right. Are you suggesting that it rotates that the, the next planning period that that blue will become active management land or that it'll rotate? It? No, but it'll rotate, they'll, they'll rotate harvest within the general management and within the special management so what areas. So it's light green and red. And, that, so, and so the, the, next, the next map is, is more helpful. So, what I wanted to show you is that if you take the green and the red areas, that's how you get the potential vegetation management areas. And this is, you know, map 17 in the plan. But those are what add together to form the pool from which they are selecting lands for timber harvest. And, and I so think the green on the left side is because in 1983 the governor said that it was scenic area. This area here? On, yeah, on the, on the Stowe side uh -huh. was designate, designated scenic. Hmm. I'm not sure. This, this, the highly, the highly sensitive management. Yeah, the highly sensitive management is just the areas in blue, but. Or special man, the light green, not the lime yeah. green. Yeah. Special management. Right, and then and within the special management, there are uh, uh, there's a wider variety of kind of purposes uh, and uses that will potentially restrict the kinds of, uh, you know, cutting that happens, um, but you know. The, the major point is that I want you all to take away is, is that these are the areas in which harvest can happen based on, on the plan. Um, so, you know, that's more than half of Elmore State Park. It's pretty that, high up on the mountain on Elmore there, too. Yes, it's a, I couldn't believe it when I saw that. Yeah. yeah. Do you have any, can I give some specific Yeah, numbers? go for it. I, I've got the harvest map on the next slide. Oh, okay. So, but that's you, but, what I want to talk about. Yeah, go, go ahead. So, so this is uh, Worcester. Here's Minister Brooke going up here, George Richardson. So you can see the harvest, most of the harvest. I'm going to give you some numbers. Here's Middlesex. The access to the Hungry Mountain Trailhead is here. So the general management acres located in lower elevations in Middlesex and Worcester make up a contiguous block of 3,400 acres. Most of the plan's timber harvests are proposed for the Worcester Middlesex block here in the next 20 years. And of the total timber harvest over those 20 years, which is 1,900 acres, 71% are planned for this block. And uh, so 1,370 acres to be logged represent 40% of the block's total acreage. Okay, so we're doing 40% of 3,400 contiguous blocks of the lower elevation here. Wait, you're not? It's 40% of the colored things? 40% For, of what was green over in the here last, before. Yeah, in the last slide. So, you know, there's just, and there's no protection for 
the, what's called the community of northern hardwood forests, right. which is primarily beech, sugar maple, yellow birch. Yeah. And um, I don't know. Can I take more of your time? No, please do. And, and actually, I'm, I'm gonna I'm, you, let me skip ahead. No, you you stay up there. Uh, I was gonna I was gonna mention a few things be, about that. Yeah. Because. Um, you know, the, the work that they did is unbelievable. The inventory, all of the data they collected is fantastic. And, but the, the plan is so long, you can keep finding places where they contradict what they say. Exactly. Yeah. Um, so. Well, and that's what I've got right here, Bodo, is so, like Bodo was saying, it's ranked as a, you know, A-ranked natural community, the hardwood forest, uh, and, and the management unit. And when, so when you read the ecological descriptions, you know, it's all superlatives. When you get to the timber management section, the first thing you see is these areas are not defined by their ecologically sensitive features or important wildlife, right? Because they're just run-of-the-mill forests. There's nothing to see here. Um, and this is, I think, how we think about the, what's called the matrix forest across Vermont, which is a, a terrible name for what is our you know, northern hardwood forest. Um, that it's just so common. And Bodo, I didn't mean to run you off the no, stage that's, here. that's where I was going. Um, I, you, should, you should come back up if there's anything else you want to add. But, you know, I, I, I feel like, you know, the, there's, I think, two competing voices at work within this management plan, and you'll see that if you dig into it. We have, an, we, like Bodo said, there are amazing staff at ANR doing fantastic work, identifying what's out there and what's missing. Um, but then, when you look at kind of the proposed actions, um, it doesn't follow. It doesn't, doesn't seem to track with the ecological significance of the area. And um, so it's, it's almost like a, a, there's this disconnect um, in the plan. Oh yeah, go ahead. I called the state forester and they said uh, that they weren't clear on what percentage of the harvest it would be, that they hadn't worked that out yet. And as sensitive as they were describing it in, in the plan about yeah. how careful they're going to be, they said, well, we haven't decided that yet, and uh, the state ecologist is going to be talking to me, and we're going to work it out somewhere right before they mark trees. It seemed a little shaky. Yeah, especially when this is actually pretty darn specific about what they're planning to do. Yeah. Um, Starting so, in 2025. Right, right. Harvest. Yeah. Um, so, you know, the state has, in, in, again, when we, when we were taking the state to court on this, the argument the state made was that this is not a final decision for these individual timber harvests, that there is a point in the future where a final decision will be made about the details of each particular harvest. But the state has never produced any kind of paperwork explaining what that process is of you know, finalizing a timber sale. So there's no way you would know or I would know how to track from this point forward how the timber sale actually comes to fruition you wouldn't know when to weigh in or how to learn more about it. So um, the state is going to have to kind of catch up with its own arguments that it's been making about, um, you know, that this is not a final decision, you know, on the ground. Um, and, and so there's, it, it, it's, it's very confusing. Can I ask you, yeah. do you have a sense of what's driving the disconnect that you're seeing? Like, what is the state prioritizing? That's a great question. And I have a couple slides that I think we'll really get to the heart of that in a second, but um, I think, Honestly, uh, we have, you know, trained foresters on staff at the state whose job is, is, is silviculture, the, 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 the practice of growing and, and, and cutting trees. And um, that's very different from, you know, what our state ecologists and biologists are trained in, in doing. Um, and, you know, I think the word forestry is not well understood, you know, that I think People uh, uh, often, I think, uh, see forestry and ecology as kind of the, the same thing, um, and they're very different. And so I think the disconnect in the plan, as I see it, is that you know, there are people who are really focusing on the uh, timber harvest uh, goals, and then there are people who are focused on the habitat. And, um, and people focus on the recreation. Yeah, and so I think that that's, that kind of uh, splitting of the professions in some ways has created the situation where pieces of the plant aren't talking to each other um, as well as they could. I, I can't say that I'm aware of any of that and I will give the state some more credit too. I mean like I said um, 
they have, we have amazing staff at Fish and Wildlife doing some of the ecological assessments. And one thing that they said to me at the uh, Stowe public meeting is that, uh, you know, the Rough Grouse Society is really uh, after public agencies right now to cut more forests, to make places where people can go hunt for, for grouse, even though, as we all know, grouse is a forest dwelling species and grouse are very common in Vermont. Um, but the state of Vermont pushed back hard on that and they're not proposing management kind of to meet the goals of the Rough Grouse Society in this um, plan, which is very different from what the Green Mountain National Forest has been up to lately, which is to, to partner full on with Rough Grouse Society, um, American Woodcock Society, and do a lot of um, even what's called even aged management. And so, you know, it's good to see that the state is not um, putting those kinds of goals, you know, out, out front and center uh, for this. I really, I do appreciate that. A new clear pressure in my mind that yeah. I've seen with the politics is that housing crisis and an increase of materials costs and politicians looking for some way to bring down costs and people look at the forest and say, there's, there's just solutions yeah. just to harvest it and it's easy and, and then it, it kind of minimizes the value um, and it makes the, I think it makes the conversation much more difficult. And I'll get to that too, but public lands provide an very, very tiny part of the puzzle. Well, so, yeah, reality, exactly. Yeah, I want to make sure you all leave with some key, key statistics kind of in your back pocket on that question because I think that's essential. Really, really, I think FPR is arguing that we need to cut trees to cut trees and, and provide, you know, lumber into the, the you know, the wood products uh, ecosystem, I guess you could say. But uh, I hate to use that analogy. I don't know why I said that. But, um, but what's that? Yeah, yeah. Kind of two things that I want to make sure this got connected, right? Sure. ANR doesn't have a goal to produce forest products, right? No, ANR a right? does have does have a uh, currently right the, the the obligation to think about if 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 not to actually sp specifically reach a target for wood products. And, and the Putnam State Forest also doesn't have like all oh, the other options. Mm -hmm. But then when you get into the, the Worcester Range Management Unit plan, yep. Right. For creating forest products, right? And I think that is where the problem starts, right? Because then all of a sudden, that's the, that's the purpose is to cut the trees, right? Rather than to manage for resource protection or enhance them, right? Mm -hmm. um, and it sort of shackles them to that commercial management versus, I don't know, resource for forest yeah. management, which could be done much more broadly and much more light touch, right? So I feel like they're like, like you said, they just put the blinders on, like, oh, so they're, they're the yeah. right? And right now, in statute, that's one of the things that they need to consider as they're, you know, that's part of their multiple use kind of consideration, but um, they don't need to emphasize it everywhere, which is, you know, where I think the creativity comes in and, and the discretion of the commissioner comes in. So really quick, what's missing from this plan? I, I haven't seen much in the way of a, a Beneke input. Um, you know, I, the state, I, I hope, would do a lot more to involve Vermont's Beneke community in, in shaping this plan. Um, the Community Resilience and Biodiversity Protection Act, Act 59, the planning process for that is ongoing right now. And so this plan is really kind of getting ahead of that whole visioning uh, exercise. The Global Warming Solutions Act requires the state to account for carbon emissions in any major decision that it makes. And there is zero carbon emissions analysis in this entire plan. So that's something that we're waiting to see if the state decides to, to do. Um, there's no mention of the Lake Champlain Restoration Plan and the contributions of forest management to, uh, you know, phosphorus loading in our waterways. And there are, you know, reductions in phosphorus from logging that are required in the Lake Champlain TMDL. Why is that connection not being made in a range that feeds into two of the largest tributaries into the lake from, from Vermont? Um, and then, you know, there's, there's kind of celebration of the rare, threatened, and endangered species in the Worcester Range, but there isn't really anything other than, well, we will look for those species before we cut these trees. There's nothing about how could we actually leverage this range to benefit those species? What, what, how could we leverage this range as, you know, and, and, and to recover species like the northern long-eared bat, um, which, you know, are, are known to be present in the Worcester Range. They're federally endangered. They just went onto the endangered species list this last year. They depend on you know, older forests. So 
Um, all of that seems a bit missing from, from the plan. Okay, now it's going to get really punchy. And to your question about, um, or whoever, I think, can't even remember now, who was asking really good questions about kind of what's, uh, what's going on behind the scenes here at the state. This plan, uh, not plan, but this, this report, Enhancing Flood Resiliency of Vermont State Lands, was uh, put out in 2015. Um, it was contracted by Forest Parks and Recreation after Irene, and the plan has never seen the light of day. FPR contracted the report, and then it has done its best since then to pretend that it never came out. You cannot find it on any state website, and it has never been cited in any management plan that's come out since uh, this report. So how did and you get it? <laughs> we got it because uh, David Brin, one of the co-authors of, of Vermont, Vermont Family Forest, has it up on his Vermont Family Forest website. And uh, we started to ask the question, why is this not cited in these management plans, like the one for Camel's Hump that came out two years ago? Um, this plan looks at, you know, the quality of forests, not just forest cover, right? We are told over and over, you know, we've got 80% forest cover. Our forests are doing great. But that says nothing about what the health of those forests are beneath the canopy. And what this report looks at is the missing forest structure, the forest complexity that you know, the road networks that contribute to flooding um, and how we can, you know, address all of that. Well, um, this is this on your website? Yes, it is. And it, it? Yep, yep. Um, this, is what, this is how the District 3 stewardship team responded to the report when it came out. If flood resiliency was highest or only priority for management, the concepts and practices contained in the report could be effective at increasing flood resiliency on state lands provided there was massive amounts of funding associated with it. Um, fully adopting the recommendations in this report as written will completely gut FPNR's longstanding state lands silvicultural timber management program by taking tens of thousands of acres out of active management. And we obtained this on public records request looking for what had happened to this report. And we got a really long string of emails, communication about uh, you know, why they wanted to make sure this report didn't kind of make its way into state land planning. And this was not just the sentiment of one person. There were many people who were af afraid of the repercussions of this report. Has there been like a changeover in the, the staff or the people I'm, doing it? I'm sure there are some different people and, and also some of the same. And I want to be really clear. My, my, my goal is not to throw any individuals under the bus on this one. Um, my goal is to show that there's a lot of institutional inertia. And if you look at some of the other emails that we obtained, what they say is, you know, uh, the obli our obligation is to cut trees. This doesn't jive with our obligation to cut trees. You know, it's almost like it's begging for the state to reevaluate what the priorities of state land management should be, what the purposes should be. Moving away from timber as a primary or co-equal purpose of state land management. And so if, if the legislature needed any reason to go into uh, 10 VSA 2601 and make an amendment to the purposes of state land management, I think it's right here in the way that state agency staff responded to this report when, when it came out. Um, so this is, I think this is a bombshell. We tried to get uh, news outlets to cover the story when we when we found all this material and we weren't we weren't successful at the time I'm still hopeful that we will get more more coverage of this at some point though. Do you know the number of uh, annual basis of silviculture uh, gross revenue in the state of Vermont compared to other agricultural industries? I don't know the the the, the numbers on that but what I'll say yeah but what I'll what I'll say I'll just cut through this and then I'll show you a chart that shows the amount of state lands uh, harvested per year, how that factors into our total wood supply. So hold, hold that thought, Brian. I'll, I'll get to that. So I just wanted to show you, if, you know, why is it so important to protect the Worcester Range? You, I think you all know at an at a elemental level why the Worcester Range is sacred. And I, honestly, to me, that's all I need to know. The Worcester Range is a really special place. It's a wild place. That is reason enough to not go in and do anything in the Worcester Range. But if we needed more scientific justification, 
you know, public lands in New England store on average 30% more carbon than private lands. Um, and in the Worcester Range, it, it, it's potentially even higher than that because it has been growing for, you know, 90 to 120 years, as the state has said. Those are old forests by the standard of New England forests today. Not old in the sense of, of what our forests could be, but old compared to, to many around the region. Um, timber harvest is what drives carbon uh, fluxes in our forests. You know, that's, the, there is no greater factor on carbon in forests in New England than logging. Um, that is the force that changes the amount of carbon more than any other. Insects, disease, fire, even development. We lose far more carbon each year in New England forests from logging than we do from development pressures, from expanding, you know, suburbanization. So, um, you know, the best thing you can do for carbon storage is to let forests grow older. And we, we've learned this conclusively in the last several years. Where you do let forests grow old, you store a tremendous amount of carbon. This statistic is mind-blowing to me. 30% of all of the above ground carbon in the northeastern U.S. is stored in protected areas that cover just 5% of the land area. So where you leave forests alone to grow old, you store an amazing amount of carbon. Is that the picture? This is from the study. But it's a really, it's a terrible picture. But is it the quote? The 5%? This is, how do you mean? Is the red stuff the 5%? Oh yes, the red is showing the 5% of the land area. Yep. Um, sorry. Okay. Um, but you know, we have almost no old forest today. And I, I guess I just want to end on this note that, you know, we have less than one tenth of 1% of Vermont in old growth today. Less than one tenth of 1% of Vermont's forests are old growth forests. You know, the largest patch sizes are, are in the you know, dozens of acres. So we have so far to go. And here we have a landscape of 15,600 contiguous acres and, and, and thousands more acres on the periphery that is already maturing and you know, among the healthiest uh, watersheds in, in Vermont, um, why not just let it keep growing? Okay, so state lands in Vermont provide just 2% of the timber supply. 2% of all the wood harvested in Vermont annually comes from state land. Another 2% comes from federal land about. So when we're talking about the difference that you're making when you don't cut in the Worcester Range, it is such a small impact on, you know, the overall supply of timber in Vermont's wood products economy. So the choice here is not between whether we get to have wood products or no wood products, as I think is often portrayed in the news media. It's not a, you know, are we going to have uh, wood to build our homes tomorrow? That's not the question here. The question is, where does it make sense to get that wood from? And if you get wood from all of our forests, which is essentially the de facto management for New England today, you don't end up with older forests. <laughs> it's pretty simple. And old forests function best at a large scale. Vermont Conservation Design says old forests function best at 4,000 acres in size or larger. So again, you know, should we focus on old forest recovery at a large scale like this? I think so. It makes a lot of sense to keep this forest growing older. Um, okay, last slide. Uh, you all know this already, but we're running out of time for this common period. There's just two weeks left, less than two weeks. Friday, February 2nd is your last day to comment. Um, and yeah, I want you to think about if you're a part of any civic groups, or maybe you're on a planning commission, um, I want to throw kudos to the Middlesex Planning Commission, which just submitted a comment letter um, in support of protecting the whole Worcester Range Management Unit as an ecological reserve. Um, and, you know, if you're a part of your town's commission, Middlesex, uh, excuse me, Worcester or, or Woodbury, Cabot, um, anybody can weigh in. And that doesn't have to happen by the February 2nd deadline either. So that's when comments are due. There's no reason that this can't be an ongoing process, that we can, you know, we can work on our town select boards and these commissions over the months ahead to get more endorsements for protecting these lands. Um, and then, you know, get ready to weigh in again. The state says that, you know, this draft rule for state land management um, could come out this winter. 
And it'll be up to all of us to get as strong a rule as we can possibly get to guide you know, public land management going forward. Um, so I'd be happy to talk more about what that rule could look like and what it would say and how it could have an impact here. But um, yeah, go ahead. When does the decision actually happen? Yeah, great question. It's an indefinite amount of time that the state could take. So the scoping, which was the first phase of, of this uh, planning process, that was three years ago. And I definitely didn't think it would take this long to get to this point, but I think COVID probably contributed to that. Um, it, it could be six months from now. It could be six years from now. Um, it's, there's, no, there's no set timeline, but we have to be ready for it to be a relative. I think it, it could happen within the year. Um, and, and so I think, you know, keeping this momentum going with all this focus on the Worcester Range is really important. And telling your legislator that you care about the Worcester Range and that this is an unacceptable management plan is a really important thing to do right now. Because as I mentioned, the legislature can do a lot to change the purposes of state land management. It can create a ecological reserve network in Vermont that protects these lands as wildlands permanently. Um, so we need to start thinking about you know, bigger picture, longer term, you know, uh, work to, to protect these places. Yeah. One thing that I, to me, it's just, it's like, why does this have to move so fast? It's like pull back on the reins because it's really ridiculous because Act 59 asks for an inventory of lands that is due July 1st or before. Yeah. So they're ready to implement this. And it says in the inventory, it says, an assessment on how state lands will be used to increase conserved ecological reserve areas. So here we are, ready to do this, and yet we're going to have an inventory. We have to figure out where. Or, well, like here's where, right here. It's like, you know, rethink the plan. And I just think, oh, change is really hard. And I think new science, Vermont conservation design. Act 59 is calling for change. And I think, you know, foresters have been trained to do silviculture, to take care of the woods. And I think now new science is saying, okay, it's, it's not just that anymore. And I just think Worcester is the place to start it. And now is the time to start it, just like the law says. So it's like pull the reins, reevaluate this, you know, go ahead with the project for the recreation areas and what you have to do at Perry Hill or um, up at Elmore State Park. But for the timber harvest, I think it's, it's time for them to, to stop and say, okay, I just don't understand where you're supposed to have an inventory or how you're going to put a priority on ecological reserve areas. and hasn't even been talked about in the plan. Yeah, I agree. What's the rush? And you know, Commissioner Fitzko is brand new in her job. And so I don't think anybody knows what Commissioner, I mean, and except people maybe close to her, what her inclinations might be for, for you know, this, uh, well, the legacy she'd like to leave, you know. Um, and, and so now is a great time, too, to send Commissioner Fitzko a, a personal email. Let, let her know how much this place matters to you, how much it matters to you to start doing things differently. Um, we don't know if she might be willing to do something, you know, creative and bold here with the Worcester Range. So um, I didn't put her email up here, but I can send that around to, to everybody who, who came out tonight. Um, you know, Vermont's a small state, and I think that even our commissioners are, you know, accessible here, and I would encourage you to, to reach out to them, even, you know, ask for a meeting. Um, but yeah, go ahead. Oh, Commissioner Fitzko. Yeah. Yep. Yep. I was wondering two things. First, is there any example of a desired best practice or management plan that could be put forward when people are making comments to point to something positive of what they would desire? Yeah, that's a great question. I mean, I think what I would suggest is uh, that the state of Vermont think of putting this entire Worcester Range Management Unit into, you know, ecological reserve management, which is what, um, again, Bodo was mentioning, uh, is a, highlighted in Act 59 as a potential, you know, uh, key use of state lands. 
Um, Can we point at some example from like Acadia or Baxter where that's well, happened? You, you, park, if there's a, a national park, there's no forestry. Right. And so, no, I think you could absolutely suggest, you know, we want to treat the Worcester Range like Vermont's version of Baxter State Park, or, you, you know, that would, yeah. that, would, that would be a fine thing to, to say. But we don't have a great example in Vermont. Um, I would say the closest thing is the, is what, is the West Mountain Wildlife. Regardless of Vermont, you know, like yeah. anywhere. Yeah. Do you just have uh, a, so which is yeah, right, right. the strongest, uh, almost like a wilderness act? Yeah. The, 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 the Adirondacks are the strongest example. That, the Adirondacks are the strongest example in, in, the, in the U.S. Larger than Vermont. Yes, the whole Adirondack State Park is the same size as Vermont. <laughs> um, and so, point, really, at Adirondack Forest Preserve. And say, it looks, you know, do we want to be, if we have a tiny fraction of, of course, what, you know, what, what would it take for us yeah. to be, look at them, this map and be proud of what we've been able to set aside? Um, yeah, that would be because that that map, this visual map, that's really that's really powerful. Yeah, that could, that could really speak to flood resiliency, forward thinking, and and being you know keeping up with the Joneses, the, having neighboring states doing a better job than us, I think is powerful. <laughs> I think so too. I mean, the Adirondacks have been putting us to shame for 125 years. Um, so, I mean, I, I wish I had a better answer for like a specific management plan that I would, you know, but I, I think the way to say it is this should be Vermont's very first ecological reserve. And, um, you know, and it, again, it is the single largest contiguous block of state land that is currently in a wildland, you know, essentially wildland management today, nor, you know, in, in, in central or northern Vermont. So, um, well, I, or north of 89, I guess, anyways. Yeah, go ahead. Like on the flip side of it, is there an example, preferably of a federal mandate, or just, again, like any best practice, that the current proposal is contradicting? Uh, hmm. I mean, like another, another yeah. oh, timeline of a different place. Like well, like essentially saying story. you're out of compliance on this. Yeah. I think I think I think the fact that I would say the fact that the state of Vermont has no rules for state land management is the biggest contradiction that there is with with this plan. But that's across the board. I deal with AHS a lot. I write yeah. a state plan for independent living as my day job, and um, there's no mechanism to enforce any of the plan. Right. And so, really, our only enforcement mechanism ever is to know that they're out of compliance with the Fed and. Yeah. AHS has plenty, you know, that, the documentation's there. It it's looks like a much different situation here. Um, we have plenty of resources to go back on, but that's kind of the only way, you know, you can litigate or you can say, you can know, you can friendly or politely say you're out of compliance. Well, there, there, there may be a variety of ways that the, the state is out of compliance. And, and so we're working with Vermont Law and Graduate School and Jim Dumont, who's an attorney in Bristol, on drafting, you know, really hefty comments on this. And we're looking at violations of the Endangered Species Act, you know, federal and state acts. We're looking at, you know, there's, it's like I said, this is currently a violation of the Global Warming Solutions Act because they haven't done any emissions analysis for this plan. I think there's a lot of those kind of push points. If you look at the blog that I put up on the Standing Trees website, I list some of those out there. Um, and, you know, I'm happy to send more talking points your way. You're asking great questions. I'm not sure if I have exactly the answer you're looking for. No, but, those, actually, um, those examples are perfect, okay. in my opinion. Endangered Species yeah. Act would be, yeah. Yeah. I'm, I'm happy to chat with you more about it. Awesome. Yeah, go ahead. Do you have a sense for why, like, maybe culturally Vermont is so far away from the Adirondacks? Or you mentioned at the beginning of Montana, like, do you, do you have a sense for why we're It's a big Vermont? budget. I think they're balancing their budget. Yeah. With it has well, not with New York, but if you Vermont and Maine have really big state budgets. New Hampshire has a much smaller budget. Wyoming has a much smaller budget. They don't have the public. Did you say Vermont has a large? Budget? Large budget. Vermont and Maine have very large budgets compared to the population. New Hampshire has a small budget. If you go to Wyoming, they have small budgets compared to the population. Right. So I'm asking about Vermont versus. Well, I think they need money. That's the, and, you, so, and you're saying that's why you think that they're cutting? I was thinking about that. I was going to you that question. I think they're trying to balance their budget. But it didn't money. seem like, I mean, looking at the timber percentage it's from nothing. state parks versus... <laughs> you know, it's 
Yeah, I, I, yeah, no. My, my, my sense, culturally speaking, is that really all over New England, it's not a unique thing to Vermont. All over New England, I think we're really stuck in a utilitarian mindset when it comes to natural resources. It's, yeah, I mean, I, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Well, and it was watershed protection. I mean, yeah, it was, it was, it was all, it was all in the Adirondacks. It was all done as, you know, in large part as protecting the, you know, water supply of New York City, um, the Hudson River, you know, um, and, you know, the Catskills Forest Preserve. Same, same story. You know, very centered on water. Also, absolutely, there was an urban population that had a really close connection to that landscape that kind of, um, I think, overwhelmed, you know, maybe some of the desires of, of, of rural New Yorkers, you know. Oh, that's and yeah, and, and, in, and in Vermont, we don't have that kind of overwhelming urban um, presence, or we didn't, haven't historically. I think that, you know, I think perceptions are changing. But in, in really, in New England, I think we have looked at forests as um, a wood basket since we got to these shores, you know, from Europe. And uh, it's, you know, been a really hard thing for us to think differently about, about the forest. Um, and I don't think there's any part of the U.S. that has figured it out. So I use some other examples, in, in, you know, uh, but I, I, don't, I don't think that it's, there's any one state that you can look to for kind of perfect, perfect management. But I do think New York is, a, is a, you know, pretty close. That's helpful. Yeah. My family's been over in the Adirondacks for 120 years, and uh, the locals really feel like, you, you put us in a museum. We're, we're here, we can't do what we want to do. You know? yeah. So that uh, mm -hmm. libertarian spirit is, is there, as we all know. But mm -hmm. <laughs> the state. I think you should look at it in the context of, while the Adirondacks might be doing a lot of things well there, it's still within the state of New York. And if you look at the rest of the state of New York, it has not followed the same path. Right. Well, yeah. I mean, it, another part of why it's kind of driven by the urban landscape is, is when you don't have it, you appreciate it more. And so that's why urban folks tend to push it more. And when we're surrounded by it, we're more likely to take it for granted. I think there's a lot of truth to that. Yeah, yeah, go ahead. What are the chances that we can, you can, that someone can pull in the reins and stop this plan? What are the chances over the next two weeks? I mean, I was hoping to hear a list of the things that you're going to do that's going to stop this. <laughs> no, no, your organization. Yeah. Uh, and one other point I want to make sure. before you answer, we've talked a lot about forestry practice. In my mind, the recreation possibilities have got to be limited. I've hiked with a five-year-old boy who said, why do they always put the trails where there's streams? And those trails aren't going to turn into streams. And every micro flake of sediment is carrying phosphorus to Lake Champlain from the erosion that's going to be associated with mountain bike trails and hiking trails. It's going to be fragmenting the forest when you, you put in ATV trails. Can I ask you a you short know, question? What? And there are no ATV trails, just to be clear. I want people, people to know that. But. What, you know, what chance do we have to stop this? And Lynn, I see your hand up. Um, do you mind if I respond or do you want to go first? Go ahead and respond and I'll just stand here and wait. Okay. Well, uh, you, I don't want you to stand there and wait. You go, you go, go, go ahead and then I'll respond. I think part of this is language, and what I've discovered in trying to understand uh, old growth protection is that nobody can agree what's old growth in Vermont, because everything got cut down. If it's over 90 years old, it's old growth, but that doesn't exactly fit the, the definition. And I think what we're really talking about is not protecting old growth, although that is the objective and the goal. What we're talking about is protecting forests and leaving them undisturbed. Yeah. And, and that includes recreation to a point, that includes the timber harvest for sure, it includes uh, areas that should not be disturbed by human traffic that can bring stuff in on their boots, that could uh, 
introduce problems. So I'm just saying the language is really important, and maybe we need to change the way we talk about it so we say that we want to make it undisturbed so that it gets to be really old. Yeah, and just, I, I don't think I've said this today, but just to be really clear, we aren't at Standing Trees talking about protecting old growth. If we tried to protect old growth, we'd be protecting this little postage stamp here and that little postage stamp there. That is not what we do, by and large. We're protecting future old growth. That's our, that's our mission as an organization. So old growth is not generally what's at stake in this management plan. That, that is not what is going to get cut, cut that down. Future old growth, or the, uh, quest, the, qu the, question, the yeah. question that John Dillon was posing in his story was whether or not to let it grow old. Um, and, and so that's the question that's in front of all of us right now, right? And that's the question that was answered in the Adirondacks 125 years ago by putting that many million of, you know, million and a half acres on, on a path to old growth. Yeah. It does, it, like in Act 59, it says restore old. So give it a chance to grow right. old. And like it, in the plan where it talked about what you read earlier, it's, you know, I think it's, it's well on its way to becoming old growth. It says, however, based on partial inventories conducted in 1990, mean stand diameters were determined to range between 9 and 14 inches. As these means were measured over 30 years ago and no removal by harvest has occurred since, it is reasonable to estimate that the dominant tree range is between 90 and 120 years old. These figures would indicate a dominant forest cover of relatively old and large trees. So it's on its way. Right? That was the forest fire in like 1928. And you know, I think, like Stuart's question, what can you do? You know, I've been beating the bushes. I have never, I, no, I'm going to say a double negative. I haven't gotten so passionate about something in a long time. So, you know, I put myself out there so people can see my spelling mistakes and my punctuation, <laughs> but I'm hearing from a lot of people. I, I got a personal call from Susan Morse, the tracker. She, she said she cut her teeth in a Worcester tra uh, tracking bobcat. Um, she wants to help me. She doesn't do technology. I sent her my letter uh, through the mail and she's gotten back to me. Um, I heard from uh, Representative Sheldon today. Um, I'm hearing back from a lot of people, and if, if you beat the bushes yeah. and you make your feelings known, uh, people are people are listening, and I, I think there's some traction is is starting. I I agree 100%, and I want to say I think that you know to be clear, <laughs> this has never been done before. I don't think there's ever been a management plan that's been stopped in Vermont, but. I think the stars are aligning right now in a way that they haven't. I mean, people are more aware of the importance of forest protection than they have been in recent memory. Um, you know, and this is a, a moment where I think, like Bodo said, you know, there's just a, a lot of people taking notice um, and interested in taking action. We have the ear of key legislators, and uh, we're going to take this. You know, I hope we don't have to, but we'll take it to court if if it, if it comes down to it. Absolutely, you have my word. I mean, that's why we're here. Um, Which legislators from the area? Well, you know, uh, I would say Bodo just named Bodo just. Yours. I went and looked at the uh, maybe four major committees. Uh, you know, Ann Watson is right here. Ann Watson responded to me personally. Yeah. I mean, you you be and they're crazy busy now at the start of the right. session, but. You know, we live in a place where people get back in touch with you. Oh, uh, yeah, yeah. I was just wondering if we already knew we had some <laughs> digital allies. Well, I would say I think any local legislator it should be where you start because the Worcester Range is, is our collective backyard here. But then I would also say that um, Representative Sheldon, please reach out to her. Let her know how much this matters to you because I, I think she, of, of anyone in the State House, has the ability to, to really, you know, uh, take a stand for the Worcester Range. So the more that the, she's the chair of the Ho Energy and Environment Committee in the House, um, and she's the reason that Act Fifty Nine came to be the the Community Resilience and Biodiversity so Protection Act. Is she yeah. the main person behind Act Fifty Nine? Yeah. yeah. Okay. Exactly. So yeah. Uh, I, Stuart, I think I, I need some uh, guardrails. I've joined up with standing trees. Uh -huh. I'm going to be a foot soldier. You tell me what to do and so forth. But honoring what this person behind me said. 
Uh, I mean, my emphasis for years has been on people in the streets, and uh, it's not at that point right now. But, you know, so I'm, I might forget the names you've mentioned, and I'm hoping, I'm, I'm wondering maybe as a lot of us are, how we can get this energy uh, and keep it, don't lose people, so thus the list. Yep. And the names that you mentioned, if that can go into your blog, into your, onto your website, so that people can reference that, because I'm going to forget the names and I've taken a few notes, but um, I'm, I'm interested in organiz organization. Yeah. And this is very organized. I'm so impressed. Those are, you are really organized. Those are great questions. We can put all that on the, on, on the website. You know, make sure you don't leave here before putting your email down so that we can stay in touch. But you know, here's the other thing. If there was a, a you know, uh, keep the Worcesters wild coalition, you know, homegrown from the communities around the Worcester range, that would add a lot to this campaign. What's that? Well, that's what, we're starting it right here, right now. Um, so you know, yeah, go ahead. Real direct question: Do you have somebody that can put together some group that is a subcategory of? You just with our names on it right now. Yeah, we could we could think about creating a Google group I mean, or something. We make yep. a name that I mean a group for us because I also feel exactly the same way. And yeah. A lot of uh, people around that we can. Uh, I'd like to see keep the Worcester's wild bumper stickers all over you know you the, the the area. Um, Is that yeah. that report that you talked about by Underwood and Glenn? Yeah. Everyone should read that. Mm -hmm. And. I would like to say that that report addresses the issues that Montpelier is struggling with right, right. now from the flood. And the, the outline of what the trees can do to keep us from going through more damage from the next flood, that is so vital. So you can, you can address that because people, Katie Trouts with Montpelier Alive is trying to come up with a plan to restore floodplains around here, but it also requires keeping trees in the ground. Okay. You know. Does that report have an economic analysis in it, or is it? Can we go over? Which, they, they, the, flood uh, the, the flood one? one? I'm not sure. I, I, don't, it did, I don't think so. Yeah. But there's uh, uh, a new economic forester that um, just started, and I've got her name. I can send it to you. <laughs> yeah, what I would say is there's been great studies done on the value of healthy, intact ecosystems for flood mitigation in Vermont. There was a huge study done uh, on the impact of, of uh, the you know, uh, Cornwall swamp on reducing flooding to Middlebury. And um, you know, there's been a lot of attention on, on all of that. Where the I guess the focus needs to go now is not just on whether or not there are trees there, right? Or whether there's a, a you know, what we need people to think about is how we can actually uh, get under the canopy and, and increase, you know, the, the, the attributes that make a healthy forest, right? And, and the best way that we have of doing that in a landscape like this is just to keep letting it grow older. Because at this, at this age of a forest, it's beginning, I mean, all these uh, windstorms we've had this winter, it is fantastic for the health of the Worcester Range. Every time we've had one of these crazy windstorms, I'm like, hallelujah, because that's creating the forest structural complexity that we want. You know, it's, it's hard on our communities, absolutely, I get that. I'm not, not wishing it upon anyone's home or power line, but in the woods, that is the best thing that can happen to help rapidly mature a forest. So, um, you know, I celebrate when we have those kinds of, of, of storms come through. Um, yeah, in the back. Um, I think you, you went over this earlier in, in your presentation on what standing trees is. Yeah. But correct me if I'm wrong, my understanding is that standing trees, your focus is on holding the government end accountable in terms of like policy and making plans and whatnot, correct? That's right. Yeah. And so what we're, I'm also hearing is asks for right. how do people get involved in a way that's like on the street. We, we have that, that, that's us too. So, and I, and I, should have, okay. I should have gotten to that earlier and I don't know why I didn't, but you know, we have a very active coalition, like I was saying at the beginning, Save Public Forests, which is comprised of people and organizations across Vermont. And we have a, we have a bi-weekly, every, every other week meeting on uh, Tuesday mornings, yeah. Um, and we would love for you to be a part of that effort. 
Um, and we need people out on the ground doing the, you know, door knocking and, and, and you know, talking to legislators, um, talking to people at FPR. So absolutely, that's a, part, a huge part. We started as a grassroots community and that's very much what we are today still. We're using the law, for, you know, in, in a way that we couldn't have even dreamed of two years ago. Um, but we are still at our core a, a collection of, of grassroots activists, you know, forest defenders. And so many people in this room are a part of that community. Um, and yeah, if you, again, if you get on that list, I'll, I'll send out a note and, and if, if people want to be added to you, we have a Google group for regular communication. I mean, multiple times a day, there are updates being sent around about um, the latest in forest management, you know, science, uh, advocacy opportunities. So the sky's the limit if you want to, to get involved in that way. I'm glad you asked. I'm glad you asked that question. And let me say this too. You know, uh, Standing Tree's success in, you know, depends on. We've made this very low bar. Um, all it costs to be a member of Standing Trees is one is one dollar. That's so that anybody can be a part of our organization. And it really matters when it comes to potentially challenging the state or federal government in court because it comes down to who your members are to gain standing in litigation. So um, if you live with the Worcester Range in your backyard, as I know some of you do, you know, that matters. Um, and it also just helps us to show, you know, the strength of our organization. Um, it's absolutely not a requirement to be a part of our, our you know, community, but it's something I hope you might consider. Um, so do you know what Vorac is, the OREC? Yeah. Yep. And they're making an entire plan for the recreation of Vermont. Uh, and that's finalized in like August 2024. So they're they're doing you know there's never been this whole huge plan and they're looking for public input just like they did with this and stuff. So yeah, I mean I'm not really one for engaging with the government that way, but you know that is they are doing that right now. They're saying, but I think you know they're mostly making small trails and stuff. Um, and so on the draft on the plan, um, the color things are say one, two, three, four, right. and one is the blue, Yep. and then there's subcategories, they go 1.11 right. and 1.8, yep. and uh, it's, and one it says highly sensitive management area, Right. so you say that means no, no activity. One generally means there will not be timber harvest. Yeah, it, it, it's, not, it's not as strong a prohibition as I wish it was, but it is as close as we have. And 1.8 is the only thing that says natural area. Right, and that's a specific designation, a natural area designation that, um, you know, is given to exemplary natural communities around the state of Vermont. So what makes a natural, a natural area unique compared to say what we're calling an ecological reserve in this conversation, which is defined by Act 59, is that a natural area is geared to protect what is there right now. Something really unique. Yeah. The whole purpose of the ecological reserve designation that we just created with Act 59 is to rewild. It's to start with something that might be really degraded and to allow it to become healthy again. Yeah. And that is, that is the whole idea of, of you know, the forever wildlands and the Adirondacks. You know, there was the same, same story. And we haven't had that tool in Vermont. And we, most New England states, most states don't have a tool like that. So it's a big deal that we now have this new category of land management to help bring forest lands back into health over time. Yeah, I'm also wondering if your blue, the blue, mm -hmm. and the article in red that says that this is not going to be logged is, is correct, if that's At you. This time. Yeah, well, you say ever. You say in the next the area, few years they're going to go more on the green, but they're called highly sensitive management areas. The, 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 the blue areas are, the state is theoretically committing to managing those as wildlands going forward. Yeah, and then they so, do say in this plan, no management. So right. We're doing nothing in 20 years. Yeah, but we need, we, need, we need something stronger than what we have right now. So. Great questions. I think we should probably wrap this up. And if you have more questions, come find me. And I'd love to chat. I'd also love to just get coffee. 
or a beer anytime and talk about any of this. So look me up. My info is right here. Get, get in touch. Um, but thank you so much for coming out tonight. I hope you got something out of this and hope you'll stay in touch.